Ahora daremos inicio al tutorial Automatizando Servicios de Red con Programación Python. Para ello les presento a los instructores que estarán a cargo de este tutorial. Eduardo Barazar Morales, coordinador del área de formación en sistemas autónomos de Ceptro BR y MIC BR. Lucas Jorge da Silva, analista de, de proyectos en Ceptro BR y MIC BR. Tiago Jun Nakamura, analista de desarrollo en MIC BR. Y Wanderson Modesto da Silva, analista de proyectos en MIC BR. El objetivo del tutorial es aprender sobre uno de los lenguajes de programación más populares, Python. Los tutores abordarán el proceso de automatización de redes, cómo crear un entorno desde cero y cómo automatizar algunos procesos de infraestructura, entre otros. Antes de dar comienzo al tutorial, les comento que esta sesión será mayoritariamente en portugués, por lo que les recuerdo que contamos con interpretación simultánea, tanto en sala como de forma remota. Ahora sí, les dejo la palabra a los tutores. Adelante. Good afternoon, everybody. We are going to present a tutorial <coughs> how to do automation in the networks using Python. But now to speak of automation, we needed to go through a previous step, that is to explain about Python. I'm going to show you some slides um, to show how important it is to know some uh, 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 programming so that you can uh, join this world of uh, programming. Why did, I, why did we choose Python? And we're going to also going to see some concepts and some uh, logic of uh, some programming logic before we start. Uh, uh, um, and, and even to tell you a bit what the logic thoughts are when you create a, pro a software a program. And then we are going to discuss the basic commands of Python. And finally, we are going to go through network automation scripts. So we are going to start discussing why is it important and what <coughs> to, why is it important to know how to program and what we need to know. Today you have to learn about the native language. Um, the, uh, in the case uh, of uh, us Brazilians here in the tutorial, we speak Portuguese. That's our mother language, our mother tongue. But um, uh, uh, we, you need to know much more than one language. You need a second language. In, in, in this case, English is one among the most important because much of the material, either of the networks and programming, are uh, written in English. So it's easier to understand and to find uh, uh, references material if you want to study this and so knowing English is important now the this is not enough for a market we also have to think of a programming language to be able to uh, automate and, and even to improve some tasks that we uh, do daily that are highly repetitive so that you'll have more time to uh, be more productive. So we are recommending to work with the Python language. Why is it important to know how to program? Well, well in addition uh, to all I just said, um, Programming will increase your productivity, it will reduce the repetitive tasks, and it will even help you perform more complex tasks that would take uh, very long to do manually. Such is the case, for instance, of uh, um, automated uh, testing. If you want to do, uh, do a script to send emails, uh, uh, an advertisement to generate alerts in the network and to understand what's happening. so. If you were, to, uh, if you depended on someone to do it manually, you would need a long time, and it would also make uh, all your professional uh, development much more complex. And we also have uh, the automated tests. 
So, thinking that you can conduct tests, uh, you can put the d device in the networks, you can run a lot of tests to see whether the device is uh, secure, if uh, the configuration practices are all right before d disclosing it to the, uh, the outside world. When we put uh, devices in the networks with no security practices, that uh, device can be attacked right away. So it's better if it, it goes through some automated test so that when the device is put in the networks, everything will be all right before making it accessible to everyone. Now here you have some ideas to um, incentivate uh, some network administrators. Um, why should you work uh, with automation? the basic automations, check whether there's uh, connectivity in the equipment and the machines, uh, also the uh, periodic backups, well, to see whether there's connectivity now and then and to generate an alert if uh, you lose connectivity. You can also think of uh, uh, conducting regular backups. Um, you uh, download uh, the uh, lo logs to a different machine. You can rotate the logs. All that can be done with a bit uh, of programming and even by monitoring the logs. Uh, so if you have several registries, there are already automated tools uh, that uh, are available, but if you want to do something very special for your network that you're interested in, it's your service, and if you want to monitor it, then you can um, develop a script uh, looking for your information so that they will notify it when there is a mistake. They can even think of more advanced things as monitoring VGP and the tables and the looking glass. You can uh, use it as a tool uh, that enters looking glass, receiving all the routes, see whether the route uh, changed for some reason, somebody um, stole your prefix or or uh, uh, there was uh, a route leak, uh, uh, and that generates uh, um, an alert because uh, and we need, but we need to understand how the rest receive our routes. And there we have the looking glass issue that you can develop a script to automate uh, the search in the looking glass so that it will they it will provide all the information if any problem were to arise. And you can even do scripts uh, to use automated configurations. So. You, uh, for instance, you you can buy a new router and you can uh, do scripts to include all the security um, uh, uh, features without the need to do it manually. And why do we recommend uh, Python? Because it, it has a lot to offer in the networks. It's easy for beginners and, uh, and it's easy to work. It's user friendly. There are even tutorials for children that uh, from which you you can learn uh, programming with python and there's many things that you can do with just a few lines of code because it's high le level language and that's why it makes uh, it uh, very easy and this it it also has a very simple syntax many of the features that we will discuss um, are original in English. So if you know a bit of English, you'll understand that the, f the f function has the same meaning as the English word. So the syntax is uh, the syntax is, syntax is very easy to use. So that's why we recommend Python, because uh, it makes uh, uh, many things easy. There are other uh, software programming uh, languages that are very uh, useful, but sometimes they are more complex with more uh, code lines and uh, much more than Python. Now, as I was telling you, Python is a, a high-level language, so it's a sort of black box. Um, and in that black box, we can use a command and uh, um, use it in uh, the uh, operative language. So it's, there's no need to know everything that happens in the, the OS of peripherals and, and uh, how to reach the sockets, because everything is there inside the hardware of uh, the OS, because it adds an additional layer where it puts all the complexity, and Python does it. And, so, and, and it turns it into Python. It's very simple. You can run the same code either in Linux or Mac or Mac or Windows, 
it's the same code that has an interpreter and it also has a very large community of developers and that's a very important thing because we choose a language because we all we have people we can uh, ask there are many forums so much a lot of content that you can tap on to improve your codes and uh, there are also many tools because many people already work with Python so you're going to find frameworks and libraries modules that can be used in your own codes that are already implemented and uh, you, we just uh, re reuse them again. So here, just uh, showing you some of the things that you can use to do with Python, just to give you some ideas. It's uh, frequently used uh, for websites using <coughs> uh, Django framework. Many uh, tools uh, uh, such as YouTube, Instagram, Spotify, Dropbox use it. So it's not just for simple things. It does many robust things as these apps here on the slide. And also, we have a project uh, in NIC BR of inviting professors to give tutorials to the Brazilian community. Everything is in Portuguese. And last week, we invited a professor of the University of Sao Paulo uh, Regina to tell us about quantum computing and she was even showing us and there you have the link that here in this uh, quantum computing you can uh, lease an IBM uh, machine to use a quantic uh, computer and they also use Python so you see that we are going to um, uh, discuss uh, simple things but uh, uh, it, you can also use the language in a quantum computer. There are many things that are being developed, and you can use it with Python. So uh, let's uh, leave some important tips here to start for those of you who are starting, uh, beginners, just to give you a notion. Um, any language, um, any programming language, you need to practice it. So if you want to use Python, you have to develop it, you have to make mistakes. Uh, you are going to make mistakes. That's a normal thing. You are going to create bugs in the codes, and you're going to have to use uh, debugging and then find those errors. You're going to correct it, and all that will be quite exciting. And you need to read the documentation. You need it to see the libraries, the frameworks, things that are ready already. There's documentation of how to use the existing codes, the uh, existing frameworks. So you need to read the documents to be able to use uh, what was already developed by somebody. So it is very important to have that notion that you need to know English to find uh, the documentation, and you need to study to uh, be able to do the programming. It's not that you don't need to fear to uh, uh, assume risks because you are going to make mistakes uh, because everybody does it. But uh, as soon as you start, start understanding the logic for programming, that's going to make things easier. So um, here I'm showing you some uh, parts of uh, the programming logic. I'm going to show you uh, a game. Uh, as I was saying, Python is even used for children. This is a game that teaches that uh, logic. It was created in 2008. It's called Lightbot for four-year-olds. Uh, over it, uh, ha there's uh, a version that's free of charge, and then another one is paid. And look how important, uh, look, this is how you can teach programming and uh, to understand the programming logic. So the, this game has a robot, and that small robot, you must make it to walk to the blue square, and uh, that will turn, the, and the light will be turned on. So you have to follow the instructions, that is like coding. So here we have the commands. Uh, turn it to one side and the other, and uh, here we have a program that we are going to run in the robot. So here our mission is to reach this blue square so that the lamp will turn on. What would be the sequence? Would you uh, 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 would you would tell it to go? Uh, forward, 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 then to turn. And uh, when uh, you give the command, uh, the robot uh, walks and reaches the other place. And then when it gets the blue square, then the light is, is on, and you go to another level. So far, so simple. But uh, uh, now what happens? We Now here we have some more programming logic and uh, as uh, how to call a function, a procedure. Here we have a program 
we have all the commands in the lower line and we need to turn on all the blue squares and you realize that we can't do it all in one field that is there the main that is the main one and if we wanted to put all the commands there it won't reach the end so we need to put repetitive tasks in a function that will be called that you will use uh, several times so to understand this we have uh, these uh, function called p1 and p2 and if we run the program all of it um, then uh, it would reach that uh, square and then it would stop but when you if we do a repetitive uh, task and we put it in a function and we use it uh, several times so uh, we gain uh, the breadth of uh, what we can do so we can call a function. It takes the repetitive task to advance, turn this on. I'm going to repeat this in the main code as a P1 and several times. So whenever I see P1, it's going to execute P1 and go on to the next command, which is to turn and so advance and calls the function P1 three times. And finally, the robot reaches the end and all the lights will be turned on on the proper positions. And here we, it starts to teach more interesting things, such as loop and recursion. These are all the tools that we work on and we use for programming that are basic tools but are also very important. Here you can see the main program. The main has just one command. So you have to call a function. Now, this the function field is also limited. So you have to self-call this auto call this we have a program that is running which is p1 we're going to follow a series of commands and then we make this run the p1 itself will run this is done all the lights were turned on and at the end they change phases so we now understand the concept of loops and recursion and it also looks at something uh, something further which is the green square. This is a condition. You have this condition, this conditional that you do only on that green square. So there you have that paint, which is the conditional. You're going to run the P1 program, reminding of the recursivity. But you will be uh, told that if you're on the green square, you have to do something special. This is the first condition. If you're there, you have to turn on and turn and then turn on the light. Once it reaches the green square, that follows the process and then completes the entire phase. So that is a basic concept of understanding the programming logic in a very simple program used by children to learn. We're going to show you some of the basic commands. We're going to tell them about the loops and the recursion so we can go over to network automation. Of course, we're not going to explain network programming in two hours time so yeah you can become great programmers we're going to show you the, the steps you have to follow so that you can start developing something we're going to share with you some interesting cases that you can share in the script so that you can do something in your networks with that you can then apply this these studies in python doing more interesting things so speaking about configuration for programming Python, remember that there are two versions. You have Python 2 and Python 3. Python 2 was released in the year 2000. It is no longer supported now. You have to look at Python 3, which was released in 2008. But there still are some things that run on Python 2. So I was saying Python 3 was released in Python 8 as a new Python version. And because they wanted to disable the previous Python, it is not com these are, the two are not compatible. So what is running on Python 2 is not compatible with Python, Python 3. And you directly have to use certain libraries and certain modules because there are differences in syntax that are quite big. And the same happens with data handling. So here we're going to show you some of the things that you do with Python 3. There are some things that still run on Python 2, and there are systems that still have Python 2 installed. So you have to discover 
what Python version you have using this terminal in order to detect the version you have. It's the 2.17 or 3.17. So please check what version you have. It's the latest one. It's the most stable one. This is the project's official website where you can download the latest version, the one that is more stable for Windows, for Mac, for Linux. Here you can see how you can check this out as well as you, how you can install this. This is Linux with Debian and Fedora. This is if you don't have installed Python, but most of the OSs already have Python installed. After that, we go to the development environment. There are several clients that you can use. We like to use the PyCharm. This is quite simple. It has been developed for Python, but you have others too. You have Eclipse, Visual Studio, and many more. Now, regarding PyCharm, this has been dedicated for Python. There are two versions. You have the community open source version, and then you have the professional version, which you have to pay for. We're going to work with community, which is open source. You can work with Linux, Windows, and Macs too program to do programming. I'll now give the floor to my colleagues. They will tell you how variables work in Python. So now we go to the hands-on section of this tutorial. So we're going to proceed to do the configurations and the commands with you so that you can see how to use a Python. So I'll stop sharing my screen now and we'll give the floor to my colleagues in this team. Good afternoon, I'm Anderson. We prepared for you something that, well, for those of you who are familiar with programming, for those of you who already studied programming language or Python, will find this rather basic initially. But that is the intention. We're getting, the following intention the intention is to start from there and we'll build on the knowledge until we speak about the more advanced libraries. So you can do that integration and check for data in the network. So let us start as follows. For those of you who studied programming, for those of you who know more about the programming logic, in general, when we are at university or in a technical course, or also if we are studying on our own, we start to speak with variables. This is the beginning. What is a variable? How do you use a variable? Do I need to declare a variable type? So this varies quite a bit depending on the language you're using. In the case of Python, we will see that this is very intuitive. Using the variables is very intuitive. The variable will identify a value which was stored in the memory. This will be the place that we're going to tell the machine where they have to record a value, and at some moments, I have to read that value. So we define this, and we're going to use this in the way we would need it. Then there's something else that I would like to refer to, and this is the fact that the network professionals, when we studied at university, we had a kind of differentiation. I'm going to be working on networks. I don't need to program. I always said I am going to be a programmer. I don't need to understand anything about networks. But this has changed considerably. I now see that qualified experts on network at least have to know a minimum of programming and development to do what Eduardo was telling us. You need maybe to automate certain things so I in those cases, create a script to help you in daily tasks. So there we start speaking about variables. Let us select a given language. We selected Python here. When we are learning, this is the PyCharm interface. 
as I said, this was very intuitive. This is now ready so that we can use it. So what is the first program we learned? This is a Hello World. I first put the print here and here in quotes, I put, I love IPv6. I love IPv6. So this is the output. You see, in this case, I still haven't used any variables. So how do I create a variable here in Python? I'm going to add a variable called message, and I'm going to separate this so it is quite clear that this is a string. This is just an example. I'm going to state that I need to implement IPv6. So instead of putting the text literally in my print, I'm going to go to my message. I'm going to put it next to print. So what did I do just now? I finished defining a variable. I just defined a variable. I assigned a data to that, and Python is smart. It's intelligent, so it doesn't need to declare this, because here, with this definition, it is enough. I just entered the name, but I didn't say what type it was, if it was flow or int or boolean, or it should bring a positive or false positive value. So I assigned a value to it, and the Python language programming language managed to identify this string. So Python makes your job easier in the following sense. In some occasions, you will see that it's necessary to do conversions, but Python already makes the job easier. I enter here, for example, a number number int and assign a value to it, 20. Python identifies that this will be a whole number without any decimals. Then I can create a float number, f, and I'm going to say that it is 20.5. And finally, I can declare a boolean, in other words, number bool, and assign the value true. We have to recall that Python is case sensitive. So it, if you have to, it detects uppercase and lowercase. So we have to be careful with that when we do programming. So then, I sent this to print. Once again, we're going to write print over here. I add my number, number int, then print with the second one, number f, and then print has to be written with lowercase, print once again and the Boolean number. So let me organize this. I'm going to send it to print. But as you see, this was very easy, very straightforward. I didn't have to define the type of variable because, variable, because Python manages to identify this. So I sent it to print. This is very basic. I'm defining the value in code, the value of the variable. That's a specific value. But we can also receive this from the user. We can ask the user to assign a value to a given variable. So how do we do this in Python? <coughs> We're going to use the input. When we have the input, the user has to type something. So we can type a message type your prefix, colon, 
and then the user needs to type this. I'm not even saving this and assign, assigning this to a specific variable. So what I'm going to write here is message. And here I will write the specific value, which will be typed by my user. This will be then saved in this variable, which we called message. I then sent it, sent it to print. And like we did with the other variables, so now in the output we have over here, Type your prefix 2001 colon db8 colon colon slash 32. <coughs> so over here where you have the word message, if I sent it to print the way it is, what would happen? It would only print the message. But we can add something here, for example, print your prefix is colon, and I separate this with a comma. And when I run the program, once it is r executed, it's going to ask me to type my prefix. I put 2001 colon db8 colon colon slash 32. Enter, and it gives me back my message with everything together. So the text I added plus the value typed by the user and was saved in the message. This is one of the possibilities we have. You must recall that we are building knowledge. We are speaking about messages. We're saying what a variable is. You can see how you can assign a value to it, and in this case, when we speak about the input, we ask the user to type something. Sometimes we have to exactly define what we need that information to be, for example, uh, IPv6 prefix. So how can we save that value? We can store this in a string. This can be stored as a binary or a hexadecimal. So what is the type of value or data that we need? I, do I have to do some type of conversion here? Well, we can also force a variable to assume a certain type. For example, I can create a variable. I'm going to call it number. It's going to receive an input. And I'm going to add the message, type a number. So the way it is here, I'm going to create. This is number one. We don't create. We're going to create number two, input, once again, type another number. Now I add print with an uppercase. I'm going to create another variable, which is sum. And the sum will be number one plus number two. Afterwards, I will print this. Once again, we go to print, and we put sum. I delete the part we have at the top. So what do you think will happen now here? Is it going to add this up? And what do you think is happening? When I click over here, it asks me to type a number. So I type a number. I'm going to type number five over here, enter type another number. I couldn't put the colon. I didn't even put a space there. So I'm going to put a six. So I I press enter. And if one of the 
numbers was not added up is because this command was missing. They, it identified the two entries as a string. So when I added the numbers, it joined the two, and these were shown down here as if this was number 56. But because we know we want to have uh, this added up, it has to add five plus six. So I have to force this variable so that the input is the one I wish to have. We can say that here I wanted to to show that uh, I saved it as an entire an integer number. And uh, so through this uh, small change, uh, when I run the program, and it requests me to uh, uh, put a number. I will put six, and now, yes, it added it. Because Python needs you to clearly state what is the type that you want uh, to store the uh, what uh, the uh, user typed. So just as how just as we did this for an integer number. If I want something with decimals, we need to change this here. For instance, here, I need to have a float that will show that there are decimals. So we are going to receive the float type number, <coughs> that value. So from now on, I type uh, a number 10.3, another number 10.2, and uh, when uh, I add it up, it's going to show me 20.5. That so identify that it's a float. I add it up properly, and uh, so we need to see the different variables, how I declare them, and that is the first step when we are learning uh, programming. It's basic for those that already understand part of the topic so that, that you've been working with it for a longer time. We can use mathematic uh, uh, operations, uh, some multiplication, uh, division. We are more advanced there, for instance, um, uh, when you elevated all that that can can be done with a python we with a sum you need a variable when we receive the, the value you need to say exactly the type of variable it is or to deliver the value directly so here i put 10 here I put 15 and in this case python could identify that this is an integer value plus another integer uh, value and uh, it uh, shows me the sum so uh, there's no need to tell Python that this was an uh, integer number so value. And if I put a point, it will understand that I'm adding a value that is not entire integer. So if you need an integer and you keep it here, I'm going to put only one. And it already uh, adds it up. How to... Uh, uh, subtract, I put plus and then minus, and Python does it for us uh, with no difficulties. It's not new, it's something that they're already used to. A multiplication here in general in the programming language, we are going to use the X that uh, is. Uh, as a sign of multiplication. We're, but instead of that, instead of using uh, the X, we're going to use the asterisk. In our case, it it uh, means that we are going to multiply. And for the division, we use uh, the division uh, bar, and we also do it with Python with no difficulties. So multiplication, division, um, Python already does it for us in a very simple way. Now, if we move forward in this uh, path of the variables, the types of variables, and uh, how they are uh, summed, uh, how, how do you 
uh, convert the data if you need to convert any data. The next step would be to start talking about the uh, ifs and else. Um, we, we would start with while and we start evolving with our knowledge. So, for instance, when we are speaking of conditional structures, they come hand in hand with some symbols that we are going to uh, put it to compare va values. This value is uh, greater than the second value that I typed, uh, or the typed value is similar to such and such a value. And we managed to do it with Python with no difficulties. For instance, here we are going to say, let's say that uh, I want to create a variable that is called ping. And here, in this case, I'll receive uh, from the user what the ping was. So type the ping value, as simple as that. And there, we are going to uh, develop a a uh, 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 list of uh, ifs, of conditions. If, for instance, if ping were larger than a certain value, here, for instance, we can put uh, a greater or equal to 10, then you'll have to do something. You see that when I put enter, it didn't bring me to uh, the uh, 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 end of the row, because in Python, you need these tabulations, these different levels. So when you write the code, well, this is very important. If this is left out, it will identify that this is not part of, it's not one of those conditions, not one of the ifs. It's a new command that starts uh, at the end of the row at the beginning. So we are going to start with this comparison. The ping that was typed, uh, the value of the ping that is missing here, I think I'm going to leave it like this, int. That is an integer value. If the uh, ping is uh, greater than 10, we are going to request the program to execute something, to, uh, to print something, to call a function, uh, that, and we're going to see very soon how we do that. But if the ping is uh, greater than 10, then we are going to put print. And I'm going to say that it's a high print alt. Uh, that is, that the latency of my ping was uh, high. So I put uh, high here, alt. And I'm going to send it. Let me see. So here, the first thing is I'll click here, and it will request me to type my uh, ping. I'm going to put 20, so I enter the first condition, because in my case, the ping was equal to or uh, greater than 10. Here it was equal to 10. What happens if I put the ping? Um, uh, nothing happens because I didn't put a condition, so the program doesn't know uh, know what to do with this. The, this would be our ifs and else. So if it's not greater than 10, then you have to put another condition. So we can do this, like here. If the ping is greater than 5, You'll have to do something. So let's do print. And let's write a message here. And we're going to say that if this happens, the latency will be average. And finally, we complete it with an else. That is, if it's under 5, I'm going to put to, here it was low. I have to put colon. Low. And what happens now when I uh, call it here?
Let's start here. There was some um, a tabulation problem, so we type 10, I type 10, and it, it um, Come, it uh, pops up because and now I run it again a seven I I uh, press enter and then mean and if I run the program again and I put two and it's going to tell me that it's low so we uh, did the work with the comparators now, the next step is to learn a bit about the repetition structures. So we are moving forward in our knowledge, and when you need to repeat something, you need to write it again several times in the code. Well, I have some tools that will help me do it in a, an easier manner. So now give, let me give the floor to Lucas, who will tell you about this. Good afternoon. Let me share my screen. We're going to talk about the uh, typing all the repetitions that uh, help a lot in the repetitive work that we'll do during our network activities. And we're going to talk a bit about the lists that Python has. Sometimes, if you, you may wish to save a lot of uh, data in just one variable. So Anderson showed you here by putting a number, a text in the variable, but sometimes the variable is, let's say for instance, uh, states of Brazil, there are 27 states and I want to store it all in a single variable. I don't want 27 variables and even because of an issue of uh, the use of the memory, we won't uh, go so deep into uh, hours of tutorial. But in Python, we have four types of data that make it possible to put many things in the same variable. You have a list, the doubles, the, the doubles or the, the sets or pairs, and the dictionaries. So let me go quickly through each, and I'm going to do some tests to see how each structure uh, how behaves. And then those of you who want to uh, delve into this, uh, please look for uh, Python material. They have a lot of courses focusing Python, and it's very interesting for you to uh, go uh, more in depth. Uh, so here you have the list. I left it here, and Control C. In Python, it's very simple. Uh, the declaration of variables is very simple. Almost everything is uh, automated. There's no need for you to tell them that it's a list. You uh, type the structure, and it already realizes that what it is. So here you put a list, uh, I X, and uh, I put Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Janeiro, Fortaleza, etc. All the states, all this information is in the list. In Python, the lists get arranged. So these items will always be there in the same positions. You can uh, change the information in the list, and it also allows you to put some duplicated items. If I, I can put Sao Paulo twice, and it will accept it. And if I wish to show this list in Python, because here it's only in the code, if I want to show it in the screen, I'm going to use uh, the same uh, structure that uh, the print structure that Anderson showed you. And I will put print list uh, low bar uh, ix, and here you'll see the list down here. Now, if I want to be shown just one of the items in the list, the lists have are indexed. So each of them has an, an numeric index uh, that starts with zero. So Sao Paulo would be zero, and then Rio de Janeiro would be one, Fortaleza is two, Porto Alegre is three, and Natal is four. Now, if I wanted to show me the information in index two, here we see that it's Fortaleza. This is a real situation. 
where there there's a lot of data inside. Well, we ask it to execute it, and it's going to bring only the information of Fortaleza. So we uh, can look for this, search it in the list. I can also see the size of the list. I brought here a lot of information in a CSV uh, file and another one that I have here. And I want to see how many items I have in that file that it brought and turned into a list. So over here in Python, I can use the length method. If I type, uh, I'll try to zoom in just a minute. Otherwise, you won't be able to see. Did anything change? Is it bigger? Do you think it's aumenting? Is it better? I think it's too big here. Is it too big now? So going back over here, if I wish to see the size of the list, the length of the list, I use the length method. And going to type here, show the list, and I see that there are five items in the list, five that are locations in my list. So what else can I do with the list? I can also use another Python method, which allows me to organize the list. I can ask to sort this in alphabetical order. I write sorted, and the information will appear even when the list is not in alphabetical order. It will sort it in alphabetical order, Fortaleza Natal, Porto Alegre, Rio de Janeiro, and Sao Paulo. In a list, I can also change information. The list can be changed. So maybe instead of Sao Paulo, this doesn't have the accent on top of the A. So I can update this in a very simple way. I take the index where Sao Paulo is, I know this is zero, and I type the new information into the Python. I put print list, and over here it writes Sao Paulo with the accent on top. So there are not many secrets here to work with lists. If I wish to remove something from a list, this is also quite simple. I enter, I write, I type remove, and then I'm going to define what I wish to remove. I wish to remove Sao Paulo, so I'm going to write the Sao Paulo index in the list over here. List ix and the index for Sao Paulo, and then I put print list again, list ix, and Sao Paulo is no longer in the list. So this is the most basic thing that you can do with a list. In other words, you can manipulate this. Then there are other ways of removing this, like, for example, wish to clear a list. I can put clear the function clear, and if I print this list now, 
list IX, it's going to be empty because I cleared it. So that is the most basic part of the list, but for time constraints, I cannot share everything with you. As I already mentioned, there are other ways of storing information in a variable, and also the difference here with this list, with tuple. What is tuple? Instead of square brackets, I have round brackets. The tuple, compared to the list, cannot be changed. I cannot change data contained here. I can add information using Python functions, but I cannot change this. I cannot delete Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro as we did with the example of the list. So this is to store data that you don't wish to change. This is a more dynamic, list is more dynamic than a tuple. If I show this here, in the case of Python, it appears the same way as with the list. But if I let me let, let me show you. I'm going to use a function that does not exist. I'm going to put remove to delete something. Let's try and delete Sao Paulo. Let's try and remove Sao Paulo. And in the output, we get the attribute remove does not exist. So the object has no attribute remove. If you wish to remain things static, then you can use the tuple function. Another way to store data is using the sets. What are the sets then? Let us have a look over here at the sets in Python. And we see this is, but here I have these brackets that are different. So the sets in Python are a way of storing different types of information, but it accepts duplicate information. So I see Sao Paulo at the end, Sao Paulo at the beginning. And in fact, it doesn't allow you to duplicate data. And the sets are not organized, so I don't have an index here. What does this mean in practice? So if I wish to print here, the variable set. It's going to show this over here, Sao Paulo, Porto Alegre, Fortaleza, Natal, Rio Janeiro. This isn't in alphabetical order, so this change positions. So this no longer maintains the order of the items contained inside. If I put show again, you'll see that positions change once again. So the sets don't store the index of this information. So what can you use this for? Let me explain. When I wrote Sao Paulo twice, when, I'm going, when I show this, it only appears once. So for Python, it already understands that this is a set variable, and it excludes duplicated data. So what would be the real function or the use of this? Let us assume that I have a list. This would be a list where Sao Paulo appears twice. And I wish to obtain information that appears twice. I can proceed as follows. I can take this list and convert it into a set. So I get the ix list using the function set ix, and I can store it in a new variable. So once I put print set ix of this new variable, I'm going to put print of the two, both as a list and also as a list. In the list, Sao Paulo appears twice. And in the set, Sao Paulo appears only once. So in order to clear data, it's interesting to use the set function. And 
one of the other options we have in Python is that of the dictionaries. Those who are familiar with JSON or with databases know that you have these curly brackets, these braces. So I have the name of my variable, state, Sao Paulo, and participants, the number of participants, and the year. This is the information I add here. So I have IX. IX for Sao Paulo is in the state of Sao Paulo. It is 2,795 participants. And the year I expect this year, this information is for 2024. When I receive this in Python, then it shows this information over here. When I need to store many things, I separate this into categories. So this dictionary format can be very helpful. It allows you to change the information. For example, now I wish to add the contact information, the IX contact. If I want to contact them, I put change. And what is the item? I can write the item I wish to add and the value. If I write print before adding that information and also afterwards, this is the output we get prior to the change and following the change. This allows me to update information in this dictionary. Over here, this I showed you just an overview of the different options. We can do many more things in the tuples, in the sets, with the dictionaries. But this is just a starting point, particularly when you work with data, with logs, with monitoring. The ideal thing is to have less variables. The less, the better. Or just one, that would be ideal. So let us now speak about two repetition options we have for Python. One is for and the other while. In the case of for, this is a simple structure to do counting. This is within Python. So how does this work? I will show this right away. So in the case of for, you need to enter a control number, which will be there. And with that information, you manage to control the amount of loops. So this is a variable called numbers. I'm going to store a numeric range from 0 through 6 using the for structure. I want it to obtain the information from the num variable numbers. I'm going to print it into a version. And it is going to do the loop until the numbers I have, the number of digits I have, is the real one. So let us run the program. There was a type error. And it's interesting to look at the errors, because this is part of our daily work. You will recall that we heard that we have the ins and the floats. And if I'm working with a number and I want to show the number, look at what Python says. Type error can only concatenate strings and not ints. So if this is a number, it's a whole number. So this has to be shown together with the text. If it's shown together with the text, it's not going to work. So how can I convert this? So we type string. In brackets, we put version. We add the brackets. And now it does work. It does the loop, and in the first loop, it added 0, which is the first number, and then added a number, IPv2, IPv3, IPv4, IPv5, and it finishes here. But we said it was from 0 to 6. 0 is counted as a number. So it did six loops. It repeated the loop six times. Then we have another structure, which is the while. While is very similar to the for structure. This is a repetition structure, too, but it used comparison. It showed smaller, larger, or equal. It's always going to compare the information to see if the information is true. If this is true, you get a code. Now, to give you an example of how this works, 
we can use this script over here. You cannot see it very well because we are in a Zoom session. But basically, what I have here is my while that verifies that the res variable response answers yes. If it's a true response, in that case, it will execute the code. It does print, loop, and counter. And as we saw previously, it adds plus one and then verifies the user's response. So if I want to rip, run the loop again or not, if the answer is yes, it's going to use the continue structure. And it goes back to the beginning of our program while. Let's run it. Let me put the information, the initial response, uh, and the counter to. So you do the first loop. It started as zero. That's why it adds zero. And it asks us if we want to run the loop again. Yes or not? I'm going to say yes. If the answer is yes, I go back up again and start the program again. One. Why one? Because the counter now added plus one. So every time there's a new loop, uh, it adds one. So that allows me to control the number of times you run the code. If I have a task and I want to see how long it took to uh, complete it, how long it stayed there turning and turning in the server, I can do it through this. So always remember that you need to see, well, here I put uh, uh, an uppercase S, if, uh, if I put it at the end, there's an error because it's waiting for an uppercase and not a lowercase uh, S. It, it's important, it's case sensitive. And this is what I wanted to show you. This is the way we work with lists. The uh, repetition structures, there are many more things that we could see now. But for the sake of time, we kept it short. Now we'll see an automation part of some uh, network uh, functions with Tiago. Boa tarde, pessoal. Todos bem? Good afternoon. Are you all okay? Well, we've already seen uh, the basic things of Python, and it's important for those of you who never so saw any uh, programming, you now have the basics of what we'll need, whatever you need to do. So now the question is, how do we use this in a daily practice? If I'm a network operator and I configure routers, how do I know Python will help me in my daily work? And the great advantage of knowing how to program is precisely that you can automate processes in the network. And uh, so if you're going to do it. If you were to write everything in Python from scratch, that would be a lot of work. So one of the advantages that you have when you speak with programming languages is using what was already what was already done, what other people did or in the past. That will save you a lot of time when uh, you need to do something, for instance, writing a code, an automation process, because the other people have the same problems you have, so they created similar solutions that uh, you can uh, tap into. One of the libraries that allows you to have access to the network functions is SCAPI. If you want to do connectivity tests, how do we uh, do a ping? Well, using Python, you can program that manually, or you can use a library that is already implementing the ping uh, function. That's the case of 
it's cap eye. Let me show you the basic thing. And uh, I'm also going to show you more advanced tools that may be helpful in the automation part. We have some programs here. And this is not the pie charm. It's a bit more rustic. It's uh, simpler. Is the pie charm better? No, no, but it's just not necessary here. When you're going to use functions that need to access things in the uh, OS, for instance, in the case of Bing, you need access to the socket part, some uh, responses of the, the OS. So you, you have blocks or protections that will prevent you from executing the ma malware like that. And because you don't want a bot to come and infect the system. So there are some obstacles to prevent that from happening. In the case of Python programs that need to access the socket of the OS, you need to have a permit in the PyCharm, the, that no longer happens unless you are a super user, super user. Here, we are going to execute it as a super user in the terminal, and we use the SCAPI library. There's that library already exists in Python 3. If you're in Python 3, you need to install the library externally. How do you do that? So, you can go to the SCAPI project here, for instance. You look at their documentation, and you can read to see. Uh, you, you download it and you install it. Here, they, speak, uh, they tell you about the compatibility. Uh, through the GitHub, you can use uh, pip to install install uh, the uh, SCAPI packet, and you choose the best way for you. Having installed the library, you need to import that into the code that you're going to use to import a library in Python. Well, there are certain ways you can do it. Here, we are importing everything of a, a SCAPI, a SCAPI. So there are some things that are already facilitated, but I, I identify the functions that the SCAPI library is using. I can also import in a way that I, I can do without this, but I think it's better to do it like this, because we know where we draw the functions so we are using from. And so what is the function that we are going to use? It's SR1 of SCAPI. What does it do? Well, the ideal thing is to go to the documentation and to look for the instructions of SCAPI, see how to use the functions of each mechanism. That it, for instance, we can put together a packet from scratch. We can uh, uh, do trace route, generate CTDP dumper, uh, do a list of packets, and here we have the SR. A function that is sent and receive packets. It's not just the ping. We are sending and receiving generic packets using Python. In the case, well, we are using SR1. That means, well, you send one single packet, a ping packet. So here, it shows me how you would use a function, and it's what we did here. We deploy it as SR1 that is executed here, turning my IP address into in the IP of the SCAPI library, and I also convert an ICMP packet to send a message. I can't forget that I need to 
change the address I'm going to send the ping to. I'm using an internal lab. And here I have it deployed using IPv6. If I want to uh, ping here, DB1, 2001, uh, DB8, uh, colon, colon. Well, here I'm going to call IPv6 and I'll add my IP address. Let's try and execute this program and see what it does. So it sent a packet and it received a packet. It uh, did uh, the uh, ping connectivity test using but Python. So what else can I do in addition to that? I can have a specific description of what's happening, send a packet, receive a packet, but what is the IP? What IP did I receive? And never gave me that information. But so I achieve, I, I, I get that information under what uh, SCAPI does. I do a connectivity test, though just as we had run before, but now I, I can see the response and it tells me, well, this is my uh, address of origin, this is my destination address. I have a positive response. If, if I have a positive response, I'll get that, and I have no response, it will tell me that I have no response. So, in this case, I'll do a test in IPv4 for you to see that there are no differences. So, we are going to execute command ping 2, and here the connectivity ISA test tells, uh, shows me that I sent a packet, I received a response, and here it shows me the uh, destination address and uh, the uh, address of origin of the ping. So there I managed to get information of what's happening using SCAPI. Wonderful. So I can do a ping directly in the OS, and I don't need Python for that. So what can I do that, as a matter of fact, can help me automate a connectivity test, for instance? Well, I can do that ping several times. I can keep it doing uh, ping it uh, every five minutes. Wonderful, but now if I stop with that ping, I need to be told. I need them to uh, notify that. So what can I do here? Something interesting that we can do is to generate alerts through Python. In this case, we are going to uh, use a, a simple alert using Telegram. Telegram. Okay, with Telegram, you can uh, produce a bot that receives messages. So when you create a bot in Telegram, it will give you the token for the chat of the bot, and then you complete it in Python, and you generate a message that you wanted to send to Telegram. And here you use the Py. API of the Telegram, uh, the API. It says API Telegram Org Bot, and you put the token of the bot and the ID of the chat with the message that you want to send. So when you do that, you'll get a GET using the request library that belongs to Python. And it's going to send you that alert through Telegram. So here, I have a bot that I programmed. So let me quit uh, sharing the screen so I can show you this better. So Telegram, why if I execute this, you see here that I received uh, the bot, I received an alert test, and you see that, uh, well, here we are going to generate another, and here I receive uh, 
on notification through Telegram and through Python. I receive a message that is I get uh, as a message from Telegram. What can I do now? I can unify the two programs. I'm going to do a ping test, and if it stops the ping for some reason, I'm going to ask them to send me an alert via Telegram. How do I do that? Well, like this. I use the Skypy library to do the ping, and the program sends me sends an alert to Telegram. So here we're going to have the same ping function that we used at the beginning. Check whether the pings are correct and whether it continues to ping normally. Everything uh, is still normal. If it no longer does ping, what can I do? I can send it here to program that sends an alert to Telegram. So here I put the code that sends the alert message to my bot. So when the program is being executed, uh, let's see if it doesn't get connectivity, then it will send me an alert via Telegram telling me that uh, it uh, uh, it's no longer doing ping and that there's no more connectivity. Now, if I execute this code here in my IP 10001, that's a router, it will just tell me that it's doing ping and it won't send any alerts. So my bot didn't receive any alerts. Let's take an IP that is not responding. For instance, here, 10003 instead of 001. So here, when I execute it, it's, it uh, won't manage to do the connectivity with this IP address, and it sends me an alert. There was no response. Why? Because. It uh, tested connectivity, so there was none, and it generated an alert. So this is already a way to automate the monitoring of my network. So it's uh, not complete yet. So I can execute it, and the program is finished. But what I need to do is to have ongoing monitoring, because then I'm going to be there all the time. So when we need to speak about network automation, I want things to happen in such a way that I'm not always doing things with a program. I want this to be executed every at a given over a given period of time and I don't want to worry about this and that unless I get alerted. In the Python I can produce a loop, which is what we did with Lucas. I can allow the program to be executed every five seconds. So it does a connectivity test. That's one of the options. Then I have another option, which is to combine the resources, the programming resources with the operas, operation system resources. This is a Linux machine that includes a service called Cron Tab. This Cron Tab service automates some of the procedures. How does this take place? It executes the command I wish at a given frequency. I can plan this. I enter the frequency for that to be executed. I can do it minute by minute. I can put once a month if required. So over here, I'm going to enter the frequency at which this code should be executed. So if I wish to execute this once a minute, uh, once an hour, once a month, once a week, I enter this information in this command, in this Python command. So that the program is executed in this code that I typed. So if I leave this in the Chrome tab, it's going to be executed once a minute and will allow me to see if I have connectivity or not. So I can decide and 
whether this should be executed in Python or in the OS, which is executed at a given frequency. In general, it is better to do this with the OS. So if we wait a bit longer, we'll see more alerts telling me that this was executed, but connectivity was not established. Now, if a program is executed and it's left running, and all of a sudden it freezes, it will stop working. So in the case of the OS, this will only stop working if the entire system crashes. Otherwise, it will continue to be executed. And if there's a problem, it will execute it the following time. So if we allow the OS to manage this for you, normally is better and causes less complications. So the option of using ChromeTab to execute the code at a given frequency is a good solution in order to automate verification or an update or whatever you wish. So here we received another alert. <coughs> this is one of the ways of automating the network. <coughs> so the last tool we wish to share with you is this over here. This is the laboratory I'm using for the demo. We have a Linux machine connected to a router. We did the ping test. We did the verification test of submitting the alert. And now I'm going to use a somewhat more advanced tool. This is a library that is in Python that does some configurations. This has some libraries that executes things in the router, captures the information from the Python itself. So allow me to share this with you. So we're back. So the NetMiko is a library that you can download in the GitHub. The purpose of this is to automate access to network devices. This is a machine that is a Cisco router, but also has backup from other devices. And using this library, the NetMiko, I can then access this device. I can enter commands in the router and save the configuration and close the program. So what do I wish to do here? I want to back up the router. I want to see everything that has been configured there. I want to generate the text file with the entire configurations. And after that, I want to close the program and disconnect. So first of all, I need to have the access information for that router. This is the IP address, the username for the login. I need to have this information in order to access the router. Here, I'm stating that this is a Cisco device. So it's going to go to the NetMiko library. And I specify the type of device I wish to access, because each device has its own language. So here, it's going to connect to the device. It's going to check whether it can find any prompt. It's going to put enable. It's going to execute two commands, show run and show version. So it will take all the information it received as a feedback from show run and from show version. And this will be saved in a file called backup.txt. This is, will be done. This will be done afterwards. Then close the connection, disconnect, and the program execution stops here. So let's have a look at how this works in practice. 
Over here, I have the Cisco file. It's going to ask for the IP address, username, password, secret is enabled to do the configurations of the router. And here we can see that I have the backup file, which is backup.txt. Now let us type this over here so that I can view what it got. This is the backup file .txt. So you will note that it took all the configurations contained in that router. It has all the backup that had been configured in the Cisco device. So using this, what I can do is to automate the backup of my devices. I can enter this in the Chrome. And once a day, then, this is backed up in a text file. NetMiko is far more powerful than this. I can also do configurations. I can include commands. And I can even state that you can access this device, you can enter all the configurations and then close it. But I think that the other options is far more limited, but there are better tools if you really wish to automate things in order to have active configurations in my router. And this is because you do need to properly manage things in case things go wrong. So let us assume that you are executing the NPython program and all of a sudden you lose the internet connection. What will happen there? Will it then resume to where it stopped executing in order to finish executing the commands? So in those cases, it's important to be cautious when we consider automation. Sometimes we are thinking of the best possible scenario, but we never take into account the worst possible scenario. So if we enter a command and the command is interrupted, what happens with the router in that case? So we have to think of what might happen because this could be, in fact, a cat catastrophic scenario. It, NetMiko is a good tool that you can use to check configuration, the configuration. You can do backup. You can also use it to automate configurations and do real-time updates of the devices. So there are tools that can manage this better. But this is the topic for another tutorial. This would involve a bit more complex aspects. So we went from 0 to 1,000. We started with a basic part, adding, subtracting, and we ended up with automating equipment using Python. But ultimately, it's about the same thing. If we know how to follow the programming logic, I can manage to look at a NetMiko code and then do what it is doing. I can see what it is doing a configuration code using tools that I never used previously, I can then see what the tool is doing. I can understand what the tool is doing. So that's why it is important to have a good training in information, because you can take any code, you can look at any library, and minimally understand how these work, how to use these in your network. So that's the purpose of this tutorial. That was the intention of this tutorial. So hopefully, this has been positive for you. So I give the floor back to Eduardo so he can close the session. So this is what we had to share with you today. There are other tools 
This could be done. We can do automation with NetMiko. This involves Python programming. We didn't manage to share everything with you because to learn programming, there are courses that are six month course or one year courses. So this allows you to evolve in the field. What we did here was to give you a very basic overview so that this serves as a starting point to see what you can produce with Python. So we encourage you to continue studying. If you have any questions, we'll be around to answer any questions you might have. And otherwise, we would be closing now. Would anyone like to add any comments? Well, we are at your disposal to ask uh, any questions you might have. We have a question over here in the chat, in the Zoom chat. I think I lost it. It was uh, a question by Marcel. Can you do the same with WhatsApp, the same we did with uh, Telegram? Is it possible to do it with WhatsApp? Yes, yes, you can. Via WhatsApp, via email, any platform that will allow you to send a message to the platform. Yes, of course you can do it using Python. You just use the API just as available. In the case of WhatsApp, it's a bit more complicated because you need a telephone number. And in the case of Telegram, there's no need to have it. You create a bot, and the bot uh, is uh, independent uh, of uh, the account or the chat. We only need the ID of a Telegram. So we need more configuration. Well, you need to pay a service. That's uh, the uh, telephone service. But yes, of course, you can do it. Thank you very much for this tutorial. I like it very much. I want to say the next step, you've been accessing the router by the CLI. The next step is that you could use the APIs that we have based on Yang models. This is as easy as the CLI. And then you start programming your network independently of the different vendors if you use Yang models that are common. So good job. Muito obrigado aí pelo comentário. Então, acho que agora a gente faz a pausa aí. So, thank you. Well, now we'll have the coffee break. Thank you.